Okay, what do you think? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Well, um, thanks for everyone for coming today um, to this first virtual uh, talk of the GDPE Distinguished Ecologist Series. Very exciting. Um, I'm. It's really a great pleasure for uh, for me to be able to introduce Dave um, Hoover as our uh, Distinguished Ecologist alum. Um, from the GDP program. Uh, he, I've known Dave for a long time. Um, I think I've known him since 2005, um, when you were just newly, freshly uh, graduated from uh, University of Connecticut, kind of freshly. But, um, and I was, I had the pleasure to work with him uh, for a field season at Conza Prairie. He worked on a project and, and even back then he showed how, uh, how much of a, you know, independent, thoughtful scientist he could be. Um, and so after that, uh, he went on to bigger and better things. Uh, he, he got his master's uh, at the University of Connecticut uh, with Zoe Cardone and Dr. Wang. I'm not even gonna attempt the first name. Um, and then after that, he, uh, for some reason, decided to go work with uh, Alan Knapp and um, that's when he joined the GDP program was I think in 2008 or 2009. Um, and so Dave uh, worked on a project that um, both Alan and I were um, involved in as well. And I can say truthfully that that project never would have happened without Dave's persistence and um, abilities to like problem solve and, and build really cool rainout shelters. And he continues to do so to this day. So then after that, um, you know, for the, the following six years until present, um, Dave was a postdoc um, with the USGS um, until he came to uh, Fort Collins in 2016 and joined uh, the USDA um, ARS program as a research ecologist, eco-hydrologist. And so he's happily been uh, working in that position, I think, for uh, now, what is it, four years, right? And so um, I think Dave, uh, you know, is pretty much exemplifies uh, how the GDPE can produce great scientists and successful scientists and ones that don't necessarily maybe uh, follow the academic track, but do really um, awesome research uh, within a government agency. So with that, um, I just want to say that uh, you should definitely check out Dave's papers if you haven't done so already. Um, and if you still want to, if there's still opportunities and time slots available, if you want to meet with Dave tomorrow, just contact me. I'd be happy to set something up. Um, so I'll just say that now we're going to hear about droughts and deluges, which happily is one of my favorite things to think about too. So it's very exciting that he'll be talking about this. And so I'll, why don't you take it away, Dave? All right, thanks, Mindy. All right, let me pull this up. All right, you guys see that? Thumbs up? All right, great. Well, thank you, Mindy. Um, it's a real honor to get to give this presentation. Um, like Mindy said, uh, came through the GDP program and I got to sit through these these lectures and um, it was a great time and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come virtually attend this today. It would have been nice to be here in person. Um, but uh, yes, we'll see how these virtual ones go. So I'm going to be talking about um, my research. Uh, a lot of what I do is about precipitation extremes, um, kind of all the way from the droughts up through the deluges and how they impact dryland ecosystems. Um, at first, kind of what's typical of these alum talks is I'm going to give you a little bit, a real brief background of myself before I get into the the research that I'm working on right now. Um, so my broad research interests and approaches um, really kind of follow two questions. One, how do these water limited ecosystems respond to global change in management? And then what are the mechanisms driving ecological change? And all my research has been centered, or most all of it has been centered in the Western US. Um, so as Mindy said, I did my PhD with Colorado State and all my work was at the tall grass prairie in Kanza. Um, I did this heat wave by, by drought uh, experiment on climate extremes. And then I went over uh, the other side of the, 
the Rockies to the Colorado Plateau, and I worked with the USGS for a few years. Um, I continued some of my research on uh, extreme precipitation, but I also kind of uh, got into more observational studies, so um, long-term records and looking at plant functional traits. Um, and then I ended up getting uh, back to Fort Collins miraculously, uh, landed a job at the USDA um, back in 2016. Um, and one of the things that I really like about that is I get to keep, keep this interaction with GDP and I, I still get to be involved just down the road. Um, a lot of my research now, although I continue my research both at the Colorado Plateau and the, and the tall grass prairie, most of my research is focused at the, the short grass prairie. Um, so here's kind of my worldview of the thing I, I focus a lot about uh, with regards to ecohydrology. It's how soil moisture dynamics and plant water availability affect all these ecosystem functions. And I think along this plant, the soil plant atmosphere continuum. And so you can start with the individual plant and understand how soil water availability is impacting its growth and performance, uh, but also how precipitation amount and pattern uh, affects soil moisture dynamics and how soil moisture then directly uh, affects plant water availability. That can get scaled up to the ecosystem level. We can think about how different individual species or plant functional types respond to differences in plant water availability. And then also the feedbacks and how changes in the plant community itself can affect soil moisture dynamics. Um, I've, since I've, I've started working with ARS, I've been scaling up more to the landscape level, um, <clears throat> looking at energy, water, and carbon fluxes, and particularly how, how uh, management of livestock impacts all of these processes. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of my work is on these, these ecological effects of precipitation extremes. And when I talk about precipitation extremes, there's, there's three factors um, that I think are really important. Uh, one is that there's increasing drought frequency, magnitude, and duration. Um, precipitation is being altered in terms of the patterns that it falls. And then there's also more extreme precipitation events that I'm gonna refer to as deluges going forward. And then how the ecosystem responds to these precipitation extremes is, is largely governed by two things. Resistance, which I'm defining here as the capacity to withstand change, and then resilience, which is the capacity for recovery and function. Um, so going back to my PhD, I, I specifically was looking how uh, resilient the tall grass prairie was to uh, climate extremes. And so this is a uh, project I did with, with Alan and, and uh, Melinda. And what you see here are, are rainout shelters. So there's two shelters covered with plastic that removed about two thirds of the rainfall. So we did that over two growing seasons. And then right in the middle of the growing seasons, we put these heat chambers in that stimulated, simulated the heat wave. Um, and so we were recreating dust bowl like conditions. And so I can boil my dissertation down to two bullet points, which is kind of sad. Uh, so our key findings was that, uh, that there was high resistance to heat waves, um, but we saw low resistance to drought, but then it had high resilience. So, so what does that look like? So here's what production um, looked like over the course of the experiment. So the first two years were the drought and then we had recovery. So the blue line represents above ground net primary production, which is how much the grass grew over the course of the year. And then this red line shows our drought treatment. So you can see that there is lower production in the drought treatment for the first two years, especially the second year where it was the lowest recorded production we'd seen at Kanza. Um, and then it, it bounced back immediately the next year once we gave it regular rainfall. And so this is, this is high resilience, even though it had low resist, resistance. So if we put that in context of drylands and why, why that's important is that drylands cover a lot of the world. It's specifically where places where it's water limit, the aridity index is less than 0.65, um, covers 41% of the terrestrial surface. It's where over a third of the people live and where a third of our global carbon stocks are. And it's where 50% of the livestock um, are produced. And so understanding how precipitation extremes uh, affect these drylands are really important because they're water limited and there's a lot of key ecosystem services that are impacted. Um, so in addition to extreme events, although I'm not gonna go into them, it's really important to think about some of the other threats to drylands, such as overgrazing, um, urbanization, and invasive species. So if we think about how uh, vulnerable these drylands can be to precipitation extremes, we can think about um, the current state of a system and how precipitation extremes can push them across thresholds. And, how close the system is to the threshold depends on uh, this ecological vulnerability. And so once it crosses the threshold, we see there's a loss in ecosystem services um, that may or may not be easy to, to return back to. And so in drylands is a lot of time that these altered stable states are very difficult to move out of. So some of the questions I'm gonna kind of cover in this talk is first, 
how sensitive are dry lands to precipitation extremes and whether or not that sensitivity varies by species or plant functional type. And I'm also gonna discuss a little bit about potential legacy effects and how that um, plays into this. So to do this, I'm gonna talk about three case studies. So one is an extreme drought experiment that I started during my postdoc um, in the Colorado Plateau. And then the other two are gonna be from the short grass step. And so one is gonna be about the sensitivity of production to precipitation variability over the long term. And then uh, finally, I'm gonna talk about this deluge experiment we conducted out there and focusing on the production and the carbon cycle. So going first to the Colorado Plateau, um, the Southwest is three key predictions. Um, one, there's rising temperatures. Two, there's more frequent and intense droughts. And then three, there's shifting precipitation seasonality. And combined, these are gonna really cause reductions in soil moisture, which is what this, this figure from Cook et al. 2015 is showing. Smack dab in the middle of that is, is the Colorado Plateau. Um, they're currently experiencing a drought like a lot of the Western US is. Um, so understanding drought and how it impacts the system is really critical. Um, so going back to this idea of resistance and resilience, I'm gonna kind of put it in this figure to kind of show you how, how I think about it. So this shit figure is showing uh, ecosystem function. So it could be production or carbon cycling. Um, with the dotted line being the average. We can think about how resistant a system is to uh, an initial drought. Um, if it's high, we don't really see a change in function, but if it's low, we'll, we'll see a drop. And then the resilience, uh, once the drought ends, once the event ends, the, the resilience is gonna determine whether it recovers. So does it bounce back to that average level of function or does it say reduced even though that, that um, event left? And, and as droughts become more frequent, it's really important to understand how that legacy could impact it. So the difference between those two uh, is gonna be the legacy. And these legacies can be driven abiotically through changes in soil moisture um, or biotically, like in grasses, we think about bud banks or carbon storage or how even the death of certain individuals in a community can impact the resistance. So if we have these legacies, when the second event occurs, we might have an even greater loss in function than, than originally. Um, so this is a, a figure showing um, water-related plant functional traits of, of some grass species out in the Colorado Plateau. And I'm gonna focus on two species and how they respond to drought. And so um, Plurapis jamesii on the left is a C4 grass that we've seen through observations and experiments tends to have higher drought tolerance. And then on the right is uh, Echotherum hybenoides, which is a C3 grass that generally has lower drought resistance. And some of the key traits you can see on here is that as you go more to the left on the x-axis, there's greater below ground um, uh, functional traits. And then on the right, it's more above ground. So there's differences in allocation as well as photosynthesis that may affect their drought resistance. Um, so when I was in Moab uh, for my postdoc, working with Mike Dunaway and, and Jane Belknap, we designed this extreme seasonal drought experiment um, using the, the unique uh, precipitation and, and ecohydrology of the region. So this graph bound below shows that, you know, as you can see, these blue bars show monthly precipitation and almost every month receives the same amount of rainfall. But what's different is potential evapotranspiration, which is how much uh, atmospheric demand there is for water. And so you can see during the winter time, the cool season, there's low PET, and that means the system can gain water. And then during the summer, there's uh, high PET where the system tends to lose water. And right in the middle is the growing season. And so because each uh, cool season and warm series season roughly get the same period, we created this experiment where we actually um, switched shelters. So we had an ambient treatment that just received normal rainfall, whatever was occurring, and then a cool season drought where the shelters were up just during this cool season. And then when the warm season occurred, we'd switch them and they'd be up during this warm season. Um, and so Again, going back to my point that soil moisture is this important integrator affecting plant performance and, and, uh, and rainfall, uh, driven by rainfall, uh, I'm gonna show you kind of what soil moisture did over the course of the experiment. So this warm drought one, the first time we started the experiment, we had the shelters were over these warm season plots and there was nothing over the cool season. And below is our, our volumetric water content. And you can see this red line was diverging as the drought impacts occurred and soil moisture got more limiting. Now these little red bars show wherever those were significantly different from one another. And you can see there's quite a bit of time during this first warm drought where we saw soil moisture effects. Then as we switched the treatments um, and the, the shelters went over the cool season droughts, uh, the cool season effects weren't quite as noticeable as the warm season. Um, but one thing that was really interesting is, is these uh, warm season drought effects, even though the shelters were no longer on it, persisted. So um, these are what we're 
we're considering legacy. So this is a negative legacy where the soil moisture is lower. Um, but we also saw months after the shelters were removed, a positive soil moisture legacy, and we really didn't expect this. Um, and then as, a, as the experiment played out, I'm gonna focus on the first three years, we saw this bounce back and forth. We saw um, plenty of times where we saw uh, direct effects of the drought treatments, like we see here during the warm season drought or the cool season drought. But then we see times where we saw these positive legacies of carryover effects from the previous drought, um, or sorry, negative legacies, but also these positive ones where we're seeing effects on soil moisture even though the treatments are no longer occurring. And we think a lot of this is, was driven by these uh, feedbacks from the vegetation affecting soil moisture by uh, either through loss of plant through mortality or reduced growth. And so how did this affect the plants? Um, so I'm just, a, for this, I'm just gonna focus on these two species. Uh, in terms of phenology, we're looking at just, just the course of one growing season, the third year, um, and this is greenness <coughs> over the, the, the year. And so um, as you look at this green line, this is what the um, ambient grass was doing. This is just what was happening naturally. And it we tend to see these bimodal distributions. The springs are wet, but we can get monsoons later in the, the season that can cause a second green up. Um, and so what you can see is this cool season drought ended. There was legacy effects. There still was a reduced, uh, delayed uh, green up from that treatment. And then as the warm season drought took hold, we saw it dry down. And so for uh, the C3 grass, Nectotherium hymenoides, we saw both these legacy effects, these lagged effects occur, and they were even more pronounced. So here we see the warm season drought treatment during the cool season uh, being lower than ambient. That means there's effects from previous droughts that are still impacting its performance. And the same thing during the cool season here, we can see it's lower than ambient, even though there's no treatments on it. And that's just because of um, uh, legacy effects from the past event. In terms of biomass, um, we have a fall period and a spring period that we measure. And that's because of that sort of bimodal distribution. And so I'm just gonna focus on uh, the C3 grass first. Um, during the fall, the first year of the experiment, we didn't really see much. But then as the experiment took, took hold, we saw more and more effects. And now in the fall is when the warm season drought's occurring. So we expect to see this warm season drought effect. But as we go into the second year, we see that warm season drought effect. But we're also seeing a cool season effect, a legacy building up through time. Um, if we compare that with the C4 grass, we don't see that same legacy effect, especially in, in the third year. The cool season drought ended and this is a case where we see almost higher production um, under that treatment. Uh, in terms of the spring, we see similar patterns where the cool season grass is, is showing legacy effects. So um, during the cool, the cool season, we expect the blue bars to be lower than ambient, um, but not necessarily the warm season drought unless there's a legacy effect of the past events. And so what's happening here is we're seeing that both species are being affected by the events that are occurring during the, while the effects, while the drought is occurring, um, but the C3 grass is showing legacy effects after the drought has ended. Um, so we continued this experiment for four years of, of these drought cycles, and then allowed for two years of recovery. And we're just diving into that data now, but I'll give you a little teaser here. Um, so what's happening is, if you look on the left, that's our ambient plot, and there's still lots of green vegetation there. It's not tall grass prairie green, um, but the plants are that's as happy as it gets there. Um, on the far right is our warm season drought, and everything is, is toast. I mean, we, we see high mortality, loss of a lot of individuals. Um, and then in the middle here, the cool season drought, if you notice, there's a lot of white flowers. And so this, these plots have had almost as much mortality as the warm season droughts, but we're seeing um, these annuals starting to invade the plots. And so there's this potential legacy effect where the loss of individuals are causing higher soil moisture, and that's allowing either the existing individuals to survive and perform better or um, invasives or other uh, external species to come in and exploit that, that niche. So in summary, um, legacies are, are important for resistance and resilience, and, and I don't feel like they necessarily are focused on as much as, as what's happening during the event. Um, we saw impacts on drought, of drought on phenology and biomass, and it varied somewhat by seasonal timing and species. And overall, consistent with other results, uh, cool season grasses had lower resilience to drought. And out in this uh, ecosystem, this cool season grass effect is really important because that grass is responsible, is, is forage for all the cattle industry there, 
for a lot of uh, wild herbivores. And that's one of the first species to green up in the, in the springtime. And so without it, there's potentially some major uh, socioeconomic effects as well as ecological effects. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna turn to uh, the shortgrass step for the last two bits. Um, and first I'm gonna discuss the sensitivity of production to precipitation variability. Um, and not just precipitation amount, but amount and pattern. So there's been a lot of research about how precipitation amount affects uh, production. So when I talk about amount, we're talking about interannual variability, um, extreme wet, extreme dry years, um, and also seasonal amount. And then pattern, uh, that's, that's generally the within year, the intraannual variability. And so we can think about things like the number of events, the size of events, and then how those events are distributed within the season. So <clears throat> there's tons of, of, of research on how sensitive grasslands are to precipitation amount. This is a graph by Osvaldo Sala showing um, above ground net primary production on the y-axis and annual precipitation on the x-axis. And this is across many different systems, uh, long-term uh, sites in, in US, Africa, and China. And these lines are showing sort of what happens when you average across sites. And then you can see there's individual sites um, and it shows their relationship between above ground net primary production and annual precipitation. Um, right here is the short grass step. Um, it has an R squared of 0.39. And <clears throat> 0.39 is, it's a predictor, but it's not the best predictor. It, it, alone, it's somewhat weak. Um, and if we, if we factor in legacies of past production, um, that can somewhat improve that to 0.58. But there's a lot of a lot that we're missing, a lot of variation that we're not being explained by amount alone. And so the question is how do precipitation patterns uh, affect it? And then what about when within site heterogeneity? A lot of these lines we see are, are just a single point sampled at one location at one site. And so understanding how, how things vary within site is also really important. Um, <clears throat> so we we have this great legacy data that's been collected at, at the short grass step. Um, Bill Lonroth and Dan Melchunas started this back in 1983. Um, and then we worked up along with some of my collaborators at ARS, David Augustine, Lauren Perensky, and Justin Derner to understand how sensitivity varies by precipita precipitation and topography. So although the Great Plains tends to be very flat from afar, it has topography. And if there's topography, there's differences in where resources are available, particularly water if there's overland flow. So there's three positions we, we focus on, the ridge, the slope, and the swale. Um, and so we asked how precipitation amount and pattern varied among these, uh, affected um, production across these different positions. Um, secondly, how precipitation and production legacies factored in. And then finally, like, what is the effect of topographic position? And we had this great 30-year record of observations that hadn't been published yet, so it was just a, a, a gold mine to, to dive into. Um, so just looking at total production, I'm just going to focus on that for, for time's sake. Um, the first thing you get at is how variable this system is. So um, year to year, it goes up and down. There's huge swings in production. And that not only it varies a lot, but it varies by topographic position. So across this whole data set, the swale has much higher production. And, but however, in some years, we see all of the points converge to almost the same amount. Um, if we take the average over the whole period, the swale has generally almost two times the biomass of the other two positions. And the one thing we first thought is that this is driven by differences in the plant community, and that's not the case. It's almost in, across all of these uh, positions, 75% C4 grass, primarily blue grama. So it's how that species is responding that's really driving it, um, not necessarily differences in the plant community. So we looked at not only the, precip the production record, but the precipitation record and tried to understand how those two were related. So in terms of amount, we looked at both legacy effects. Those are fall, cool season, and previous growing season uh, precipitation, as well as the current year. And so the current year we broke down into growing season, which was April through August and the spring. Um, and as you can see, that time of year is when we get the, the bulk of our moisture. In terms of pattern, we broke it down into these four categories, the event size, the number of events, the number of consecutive dry days in a row, and the number of these large precipitation events defined as, as greater than the 90th percentile. So <clears throat> we created a metric of sensitivity, and essentially for each 
metric of precipitation, we, we asked how the slope varied um, and how that was different for each position. So uh, if there was a negative value, that meant there was a negative slope and positive means positive slope. And the closer the numbers are to one or negative one means that they're much greater slopes. And so if we use this metric to, to see how uh, sensitive these systems were to the current year amount, um, what, let me orient to these graphs. So we have sensitivity on the y-axis across the different positions. So the greater, the greater the value is and the more positive, that's a more steep slope. And then negative means a negative slope. And the closer you get to minus one, that's a steeper slope. And the colors are, are showing us if there's a, a main effect overall of precipitation, but it didn't vary by topographic position. However, if we get yellow backgrounds, that's showing that there was a, a precipitation by topographic interaction, meaning that there's differences in sensitivity. So what this shows here is that the swale was much more sensitive to growing season precipitation than either the ridge or the slope. And if we break that down into pattern, we also see differences in sensitivity. So they all responded roughly the same to event size, although they're responsive to event size. But in general, the swale was much more responsive to the number of events, uh, consecutive dry days, and then uh, large events. Uh, as far as the, how production is sensitive to legacies, we broke it down into prior production, as well as these different precipitation metrics. And so surprisingly, we didn't see a, a large effect of precipitation metrics here. Um, and the biotic metrics were, we saw sensitivity, but it wasn't great and it didn't it didn't vary by topographic position. Um, and so in summary, uh, production varied by topographic position. Um, it has a high degree of variability year to year. And that sensitivity varies uh, by amount and pattern in topographic position. And while production was sensitive to these biotic legacies, we didn't really see strong evidence for precipitation legacies. So, now we'll turn to the last case study, which is uh, deluges during drought, and that also was out in the shortgrass step. Um, so, so why deluges? Why do we expect these heavier rainfall events with, with climate change? Um, it's driven by really two things. Uh, one is that warmer air drives more evaporation, and so that means there's more water going into the atmosphere, but warmer air also holds more water. So as every degree Fahrenheit, the atmosphere increases, it can hold 4% more water vapor. So essentially the sponge is getting filled up faster and, and more before it gets wrung out. And we see that uh, these trends across the US are pretty uh, consistent through time. And so this is showing the relative number of extreme precipitation events going back from the 1900s up, up through present. And so we're seeing this increase um, throughout time. And so we were interested in kind of how these co-occurring extremes gonna uh, uh, play out and affect production and carbon cycling. So what happens if you have a, a deluge during a drought? And so this idea came from some of the work by uh, uh, GDP's own Allison Post, who did this awesome experiment out um, in the short grass step where she added a deluge during an average year. She added different amounts um, from ambient up through 92 millimeters. And this is showing canopy greenness. So the response to that deluge um, and you can see that there was a pronounced effect uh, and it varied by the amount that was added. Um, and so this got us thinking, you know, what happens if we have a deluge during a drought? Can that actually rescue production for this year? And, and, and working with uh, ranchers and stakeholders and land managers in the area, it's something that's really relevant, um, especially this year. This year we had a drought and it was a big question but from the rancher community, what what do we need to get out of this? You know, will a large event, if we have a one inch, two inch, three inch storm, what do we need to get our, our forage production back so that our, our cattle will start gaining weight again? Um, so we put together this deluge experiment. And so this is with um, quite a few uh, collaborators at CSU that I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with. And so to do this, we had these rain out shelters and we had control treatments. Um, so these rainout shelters excluded rainfall the entire time. And then we added rainfall. And to add rainfall, we decided to pick the most average year, which was 1989. So uh, in terms of pattern and amount, 1989 was the most boring normal year we could get. So any day that it rained in 1989, we added the same amount uh, on that day. And so that allowed us to control for any sort of weird variability that 
always happens in rainfall in this system. So then we had a few other treatments. So we, uh, on the far right, we have our, our drought, which was a, a large reduction from that amount. And so we just re reduced event size. We didn't change the number of events. They just were smaller. So then instead of uh, receiving 138 millimeters, it received only 31 millimeters. Um, and then we had two water addition treatments. So one was a deluge, a 60 millimeter deluge that we added right in the middle of the summer. And then we wanted to know how that would compare if we broke it up into a bunch of small events. So the deluge drought treatment, the deluge small event treatment received the same total amount of rainfall, but it was in different patterns. And so, you know, the question is, how do those two differ from one another? Really get us a, a sense of, you know, does it the deluge that matter or is it just the total amount that matters? So <clears throat> here's what soil moisture look like. Um, let me give you a second to orient yourself. So you can see above the precipitation pattern for each of these treatments. And then what this is showing is essentially the soil moisture bucket. So um, this is going from the surface down to 75 centimeters, and this is through time. And the cooler, the cooler uh, uh, colors are showing more water. And so you can see that all the treatments started with a fair amount of water in the springtime, but then dried out as the summer progressed. Um, the deluge event is really notable. You can really see the, how that wetted up the, the soil moisture profile. Um, and then the small events, you can see some, it doesn't get quite as yellow as the drought. Um, so they did have an impact, although not quite as dramatic of an effect as that deluge event. In terms of phenology, <clears throat> we measured greenness um, throughout the course of the growing season. And so we have our control treatment here in green, and then our three treatments that from May through the middle of July, all were receiving the same intensity drought. And so that difference between the control and, and drought is uh, the three drought treatments is a pretty notable drought effect. So going into this deluge, things were toast. They were incredibly crispy. And so um, the question is how much could they green up? Could they green up at all when we added this event? Um, so here's our deluge, middle of July, and here's what happened. We, we saw ambient greenness <clears throat> drop and kind of slowly crash. Um, but the deluge bounced back pretty fast. To, to one point, it was actually greener in the drought plus deluge treatment than the, the ambient control, or the 1989 control. Um, <clears throat> our drought plus small event treatments, we did see an effect that took a little while to play out. But later in the growing season, we saw an increase in greenness, although not as, not as much. Here's what the plots look like um, three days post deluge to get a sense of the greenness. Um, and this is a pretty fast greening. It, it only took three days. and um, it was almost indistinguishable be between the control and this drought plus, plus deluge treatment, whereas the drought and small events and the drought treatments, um, you know, stayed, stayed really brown. We measured carbon cycling. Um, so this is a custom net ecosystem exchange chamber we used. Um, it was portable. And <clears throat> what it measured was the, the, the difference between gross primary production, which is the uptake, and the loss of carbon uh, from the ecosystem through uh, respiration. And so this chamber is measuring net ecosystem exchange. And so one of our questions was, how does this pulse of water during a drought affect carbon cycling? And so here's, here's just looking at net ecosystem exchange right after the deluge. So here's pre-deluge where the treatments were, they fairly converged. Um, zero means there's no net exchange. That means that difference between gross primary production and respiration uh, are zero. As you get positive, that means you're having greater respiration, you're losing more carbon to the atmosphere. And as you're negative, that means you're, you're uptaking carbon. And so what happened right away with this deluge is a big loss of carbon. And we can break down uh, those two fluxes because we, we use a cover to stop photosynthesis. So the reason why we, we had that pulse is because we had a huge increase in respiration. So essentially the microbes and uh, below ground processes were able to become active before the gross primary production took off. However, as things greened up, we can see a huge drop in net ecosystem exchange as we saw the green up, more leaf tissue, more photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Um, and then uh, after, by the end of the year, it stayed a little bit lower um, than the drought and eventually converged. However, we did see the small event have an effect. So here it's, it's getting lower and lower, but as the moisture built up for those several small events over the course of August uh, and July, then we saw a negative uh, carbon uptake. In terms of production forage, this was measured at the end of the year. Uh, this is just looking at C4 grasses. It's the dominant grass, and this is what the ranchers cared about, you know, when they wanted to know, can the production come back? Well, sort of is the answer. Uh, so here's our control. Here's 
how much production there was just in the control alone. The drought plus deluge is not equal to the control, but it didn't receive as much precip as the control. And it's actually not statistically different from it. Here's the small events. And as we can see, the small events in the drought plus deluge aren't different from one another statistically, although the means are quite a bit different. And this drought plus small events is not different from the, the drought alone. And so um, this is kind of interesting. It's, it's, it's a mixed bag. So we're seeing that this pulse of water does have an effect and slightly varies by how it's distributed, but um, it's not not entirely clear. And so one of the things that was really interesting this year is uh, we had a, a deluge during a drought. And so this was uh, the year after we did this experiment. So we were really interested, hey, can we use some of these results we had to make predictions about what's going to happen? And so based on the amount we received, we predicted a certain amount of greenness over a certain period of time and um, that there'd be a, a flush of, of greenness. And here's some animation. This is showing, uh, this is done by Sean Carney, a postdoc at the USDA, and uh, this red area is showing where it received over an inch and a half. And so we thought that, you know, we'd see this big flush of green that would be consistent with that. And so I'll play this animation. This is going through May, June, and that's where the deluge was. And so not a huge effect. We see there is a little bit of a green up here, um, but what we didn't, we noticed after playing it a few times, if you look at these little spots here, uh, I'll play it again, keep your eye on those. You see they start start to green up and there's little pock marks of production and this is due to a, a a legacy of runoff and so this event was so intense that it actually created a ton of runoff in the system and that added a water subsidy to these lowland positions which is consistent with what we saw in our um, production or our long-term production record that these uh lowland topographic positions were really sensitive to these heavy events um, and potentially the reason why the upland system didn't respond as we predicted was that it didn't actually receive that much moisture into it because there was a surface runoff. Our experiment prevented any surface runoff because we just wanted to know how much that deluge uh, infiltrating into the system alone affects it. Um, but this shows like just how important some of this landscape level movement of water is on these uh, production dynamics. So in summary, uh, deluges can uh, stimulate greenness carbon cycling and, and production during drought. Um, but there is some murkiness between how these multiple small events um, can have similar impacts to these deluges. Um, and so uh, another question we could ask is if we had bigger deluges, is that gonna really be uh, <clears throat> what differentiates the two? And then third, um, runoff during these natural deluges are important, it's important to consider. And you know something we missed experimentally um, but certainly an important factor in the system. So with this last little bit of time, I, I wanna kinda tell you about the, what I'm, my current work is, um, and most of it's at the Central Plains Experimental Range. Um, when I started as a graduate student, um, this was still part of the LTER network. Um, <clears throat> there was a ton of research going on there. There's a real strong like CSU uh, connection out there. And, um, I wanted for those new students that are thinking about where to do work and for some faculty that maybe don't work there anymore, I wanted to kind of let you know some of the work that's, that's going on there and uh, some of the work I'm involved with and just kind of put it on everyone's radar. Um, so over this past decade, there's been a huge emphasis on, on technology and, and data and putting that in to really figure out precision uh, livestock management. Uh, it's currently a NEON site, it's the first NEON site to go in, um, and it's also part of the LTAR network, the Long-Term Agro Ecosystem Research Network. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, um, it's an observational network that was developed a few years ago um, that has these site-level common experiments. Um, and also, uh, it's got an emphasis on stakeholder-driven research, which is, I think, what differentiates it from uh, NEON and the LTER network. And so I'm gonna give you a, a little taste of what the common experiment we're working on at at uh, CPR right now. Um, so in 2012, uh, before, before I got there, uh, the, the research unit developed this collaborative adaptive range land management project um, that took a really novel approach. They took stakeholders from uh, federal agencies, ranchers, environmental groups, um, and put them together to, to create a, a, a study that they'd be guiding, that they would be in charge of the experiments. And then there's a group of scientists and 
they kind of had to, you know, we had to sort of step back and provide them with data, um, but allow them to really run the decision making. Uh, and the goal of this group is to, to pass land on to future generations, both ecologically and, and economically. And so there was four key goals that the stakeholder group uh, came up with. So profitable ranching, um, vegetation and wildlife diversity, as well as social learning between the different uh, stakeholders. And so they designed this rotational grazing experiment here. I'm not gonna get into too much of the details, but the idea is that they were gonna move one large herd through these pastures. And by uh, changing the time at which they were at pastures, they can achieve these different uh, objectives. And so uh, my work related to this is uh, this sensor network. And so since I've started with the ARS, um, I've been working with David Smith to install this network of uh, soil moisture, precipitation, uh, micro watersheds and, and eddy covariance. And it's embedded in this uh, experimental framework. And so uh, we're looking at how uh, rainfall and uh, soil moisture sort of affects the differences in the collaborative adaptive herd, which is um, one large, about 200 steer herd that's moved among these 10 blue pastures and how that compares to traditional rangeland management where that same amount of cattle are distributed and fixed into these 10 red pastures. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I've been working on is, is supplying stakeholders with this information. Um, so taking our ground-based sensors and transmitting that data uh, through de telecom to these uh, data storage and automated processing uh, scripts that we put together. And those output these dashboards and reports, for example, this map that you see here. And that allows the, the, the ranchers and the um, different stakeholders in this group to decide, you know, how much water has one side received? Um, what's the current soil moisture status? Should we rotate the herd over to this pasture now to chase the green? Um, so there's a huge value for, for that. But then also, um, it, it allows a lot of, the sensor network allows a lot of questions about um, dryland ecohydrology. So here's that initial conceptual model I, I showed of the things that I, I'm really interested in. And these all, all these sensors really tie into that. So we're measuring precipitation amount pattern in this, uh, one of the denser rain gauge networks in, in the country. Um, we're measuring soil moisture dynamics through time and multiple depths, um, using eddy covariance towers to measure the fluxes of carbon and water and energy and how that is impacted by these different um, cattle management uh, uh, strategies. And then finally, we're also measuring surface runoff. So we can ask some of those questions about, you know, with a big deluge event and we have surface runoff, how does that redistribute water and how does that affect um, production. Um, <clears throat> so maybe one of the takeaways that you got is, through this talk is that um, in the six years since I've left CSU, I've, I've kind of went from a, I was grounded more like in academia, experimental approaches and sort of theoretical. And now I've, I've moved to government and I've brought in observational um, research and taken on more of an apply. And it's been, been a fun evolution, it's been a, a challenge certainly changing uh, some of the approaches and some of the applications of what I do, but it's been re really rewarding. And I think one of the things that I've learned a lot through this, uh, you know, time span is just how important these these managed landscapes are. And so, if you look at this map, um, that sort of just it's just a graphical representation of how much of the country is used for different uh, uh, land use types. And so, as you can see, right in the middle of the largest square is this cow pasture range. And so, you know, thinking about how we can adapt to a changing climate, how we can have sustainable food production, um, and also uh, how we can prevent a lot of these areas that cover a huge part of the world from uh, major degradation as climate change uh, continues. Uh, that having this um, applied approach and working in these messy managed systems, even though they're very challenging, um, has its value. And so, I'll leave you the few take home po points and then hopefully we've got some time for some questions. Uh, so by now, I'm, I hope that I've convinced you that these drylands are sensitive to extreme precipitation, as well as these more subtle patterns that are changing with climate change and may have some pronounced effects. Um, the legacies are, are really important in, in shaping the responses to future extreme events. And as events become more frequent, then these legacies might play a greater role. Um, and finally, you know, incorporating science-based adaptive management is one possibility for us to um, ad adapt and allow land managers to uh, change their practices to uh, changing precipitation. 
Um, with that, I'd like to just thank everyone that's participated in these projects. Um, tons of tech support over the years, some really long-term research, and then uh, some of the institutional support I've received over the years. And with that, I will open it up for questions. I don't know how we want to do this. Mindy, if we want to have uh, chat people submit them in the chat box or um, speak up, maybe I'll, I'll let you run that. Well, um, so uh, how about we, if people could raise their hand, maybe, uh, maybe not, maybe chat and then you could, and then I'll just say if you have a question. And, okay, let me start over. If you want to ask a question, um, indicate it in the chat and, and then I'll just call on you to, to ask your question for Dave. But first, I just wanted to say uh, thanks for a great talk, Dave. And, and Thank you. Thanks for having me. Colin. Any questions out there in the ether? <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. You want to you want to ask a question, Ruth? Yes, I do. Right. Um thanks for a great talk, Dave. That was really fascinating. Um I have multiple questions, but I'll just start with one like big overview one. What do you, what do you think, um, say 25 years from now, what's cattle production going to look like in this area, given all that you know about those legacy effects and the droughts and deluges we're likely to be having in the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so <clears throat> again, I think if, there's a couple of things that, that land managers can do. They, they can adapt their practices. Um, so say you have a more extreme and variable climate. Now, if you know, if you have a prediction of what's going to happen in the next six months to a year and what that translates to it, your forage production and, and weight gains, then you can make some decisions. You know, you can decide whether you want to sell some of your cattle to reduce your stocking densities, whether you want to move your cattle to different places. So think about, if you had an area with a lot of uh, lowlands, potentially that's that's a spot that after a deluge you might want to go and bring your cattle into graze. Um, some of the folks I work with out at the USGS, um, they're experimenting with different breeds of cattle. So there's uh, the Canyon Lands Research Center and uh, Hornada are introducing this Criollo breed that um, is more drought adapted. And so there's a potential that you know you could adjust your management practices and also try these different breeds of cattle to see if there's a way to make them a little more um, climate resistant. Uh, there's other, the other fact is that places like the Northern Great Plains might be even more productive for cattle grazing. So there's potentially a shift that, you know, that could be a place where there's more livestock production because there's less uh, temperature limitations there. So I don't know if that, that answered your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, it looks like uh, Bennett Hardy has a question for you. Great. Hi, thanks so much uh, today. That was a great talk. Um, as a GDP PhD student and seeing your progression from CSU to government work, I guess looking back, what kind of advice would you give uh, your former self as someone who <laughs> went to the government field or um, something that you can speak to, a specific skill maybe, or something you wish you had known? Sure, yeah. Um, when I was in grad school, I, I didn't necessarily have government as a career option in mind. I was just trying to get through my PhD. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of grad students that I've met that are like definitely on a government track. I, I think they either have worked in government and know what, it, what a job like that looks like. Um, but I think, you know, what I would say helped me with that transition was uh, just kind of being flexible. There's a, there's, a, there's a big difference in approaches, right? So uh, I feel like the academic world tends to be more interested in theory and understanding some of the theoretical underpinnings of how things happen. Um, in government, there's like particularly for like uh, the USGS and the ARS, which I've worked with, um, there's a huge management component. And uh, so the, the question is how you can change that research focus to having a applied outcome. Um, and the other challenge shifting from government was just that they're 
do business very differently. Uh, there's certainly some more restrictions uh, just because they're, they're government, but then there's some other benefits. You, you have, um, like an ARS is great because it's a hard funded program. I don't have to chase, chase money like uh, some academics uh, have to. And so that's, that's a benefit. Um, but yeah, I think as you, Bennett, what I would suggest uh, just to, to cast a wide net, I was applying for both faculty and government jobs. And when I had a job pop up that I really was excited about in Fort Collins, which is a place I really wanted to live, it was kind of a no brainer. Um, and so, yeah, great question. Awesome, thank you. Okay, um, and then we'll take a question from Jenna Parker, and then uh, Don has uh, something to uh, present to Dave. Hi, um, great talk, thank you so much. Um, you. I do research in an area, a grassland with a big riverbed, and so when there are deluges, the water just runs into the river and then goes to another area, and I know you're kind of, you said your research is kind of moving in more of a runoff direction. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you see deluges as causing more of a problem in these areas, because even in the, like, the water's not necessarily going to a lowland and causing greater productivity there. It's just kind of running to a completely different mm -hmm. area where the cattle in that area don't get any benefit. So I just was wondering your thoughts kind of on how riverbeds, for example, might affect these dynamics. Sure, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so generally, I'm just gonna talk about the shortcraft step, the system I'm most familiar with. Um, the, the longstanding uh, thought was that their runoff isn't a factor. Like it does, maybe it happens sometimes, but it really doesn't affect production. And so one of the features in the shortgrass prairie is that there's a lot of depressions. And so the water will go in there and there are these closed basins that don't actually leave. But there are areas that there are dry riverbed channels that like this past deluge event actually flowed. And so if you think about it from a water balance perspective, it certainly can affect production because that water is then leaving the system. It's not being redistributed on like say your own ranch or the property that you're managing it's leaving the system. And so that's that's a big effect, especially in just how limited and how tied um, both uh, forage production, livestock production is to, to the, the amount of rainfall. So yeah, it's a great question. Great, thank you. Okay, um, well, we probably should try to wrap this up, but like I said, if you, uh, if you have more questions, I'm sure Dave would be happy to hear from anybody. Um, and if you uh, wanna, talk more deeply with Dave, you can do so by just contacting me and we can try to uh, set up a, a time for you to talk to him virtually. Um, but as with all GDP talks, Dave knows this, um, you get, we'd like to provide some recognition for the talk and so Don is, is gonna present that to you. Okay, so uh, Dave, I don't know how well you can see this, but, and I'll get this to you um, by mail. Okay. But, um, so anyway, thanks so much for being our distinguished ecologist alum, honored alum. And uh, so, yes, this is going to come to you. All right. Well, thank you. And yeah, thanks again to everyone for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you again, Dave. That was a great talk. Thanks. All right. Okay, with that, Take I care. guess we'll see each other later. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Oh, actually, maybe Ruth, you could remind everybody of the next talk when that is going to happen. Yes, the next talk is um, Francesca Catrufo on November 4th, I want to say. Um, the afternoon of November 4th. Let me just double check that date. Oh, the day after election day. So hopefully we'll all be there. <laughs> yes, hopefully it will be um, a happy day for all. And if not, Francesca's talk will cheer us up, right? Yes, yes. And so <laughs> please uh, get that on your calendar if it's not already through Dawn's invite and see you there. And thank you so much, Dave. That was really great. Yeah, thanks. I'm really super fascinated by the legacy effects that you see and the potential for like for invasion and complete community shifts. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's kind of one of the data sets we're digging into now is looking at, yeah, kind of grounded in some of Mindy's, Mindy's theory about how these uh, you know, these extra resources can allow the community to just change right after. And so, yeah, we have two years of data. We'll, we'll see what's, what's happened if it stayed kind of fixed in that annualized state or if it's um, bouncing out of that. So great. I'm excited to hear cool. about that. And I'll get to talk All to right. you more about that tomorrow. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I'm going to end everybody. the meeting.
Thanks. Bye. Bye.